Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome, uh, senior class of 2012, and welcome to our 2014 Hall of Fame inductees. We're very happy to have you here with us today. So we, we've been inducting people into the Hall of Fame since, I believe, 2008. It, uh, a new initiative was started at the school. And we've had some really interesting and exciting uh, people come back that have graduated from Wakefield High School and done some pretty extraordinary things in their lives. And after seeing a couple of those events, I said, you know, the students have to see this, and especially our seniors, because this is uh, such an important time in your lives. You're about to graduate this May. Uh, and to, to go off into the next step in the journey of your life. I see a few people looking very anxious about that right now. Right. Um, and it is. It's a little bit scary. It's a little bit frightening. What am I going to do? And I think sometimes you feel like when you're in high school, you have to know right now what I'm going to do with my life. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on you right now to get into the right college and to, you know, or to, 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 to pick that path right now and to decide. But I hope, as you hear the journeys of other people, um, that they have a lot of wisdom to share with you in just the choices they've made and the things that they've done and the places that they've gone. And the coolest thing in the world is that they went to this school, they found their old lockers here, some of them uh, that, you know, that, went, that actually went to this building, um, and they came from the same place where you are sitting now. So it's such a, an interesting, unique, and wonderful opportunity to hear them speak. So, um, what we'll do is I'd like to have each of them come up and talk to you a little bit uh, about themselves, and they were inducted in various categories, so we're recognizing people for their contributions to the military, uh, to government, to education, to the sciences, sciences and medicine, uh, to the arts, to business, and, and this is a very special, special achievement induction this year. Uh, so I really think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, but to kick things off, before we hear from our Hall of Fame inductees, we're going to start with the school committee member and say a few brief uh, opening remarks to you, uh, Mr. Evan Kenny. And uh, Evan was a, a member of the class of 2012. And uh, how many of you knew Evan when you were in school? Many. Okay, so, and many of you know him now. And I think what he really can bring to the table is the kind of things that you can do from the minute you walk out the door to make your mark in the world. And he's a pretty special guy and one of my favorite alumni. So let's start with uh, Mr. Evan Kenny. One of your favorites, huh? Are you allowed to pick favorites? Um, I uh, thank you. Uh, I'll tell you guys, to echo what Dr. Smith said, um, when I was a senior, um, oh so long ago, and I came to this assembly, it was one of the most rewarding experiences. I heard some awesome stories from people who, we often hear about how you have to go to the best school, and you have to work really, really hard to get really super good grades, or you're a failure. And a lot of the people you hear from don't have such a conventional path. Um, and I'm one of those people, and I'm certainly not ready to label myself as successful yet. But I've learned a few lessons in the past two years since I've left here um, that I think are valuable for you, and that's why I wanted to share them with you. And you know, I had a speech written, and I spent a lot of time typing it out and, uh, and making sure every word was, was chosen wisely and was deliverable. And then I said, why am I doing that? I know so many of you. I played baseball with some of you. Uh, I grew up with some of you. And so why should I script what I'm going to say to you? Instead, I decided I wanted to just come talk to you because I have one message to share with you. And it has to do with success, and you're obviously going to hear a lot about that between now and graduation. You're going to hear a lot of success stories today. But what mine has to do is more what you can do to succeed in the next few years of your life, to put yourself on a track that makes you more prone to success and makes it a lot easier than it will for your peers. And the key to that success will be risk. Not necessarily hard work, although it helps, or good grades, although they help, but risk. Your willingness and your ability to put yourself out there, your confidence, your willingness to take risks in the real professional world. Because now is the time to do it. I'll tell you my story about the risks that I took that kind of piled up one after the other and led me to a place that Frankly, I'm happy with it, and I'm proud of it, and I have a lot more work to do. But I know that I can move forward knowing that I have some accomplishments on my resume. And it's a good feeling, because a lot of your peers, I'll tell you, and I don't care if I'm being too hard on you guys, because I know you. 
probably 98% of you may not have the drive, may not have the passion to do it. It's not about hard work, and it's not about intelligence. It's not about any of that. It's about confidence and your willingness to do it. When I was in these seats two years ago, I was this crazy Ron Paul supporter. I wanted Ron Paul to be president, which of course was never going to happen, but I wanted it to happen. That's what I was passionate about. So I decided to run to be a delegate to the Republican National Convention. And I showed up to a meeting where we were supposed to nominate delegates, and that was my purpose. I showed up with a speech in hand. I was ready to go. And all I had to do was raise my hand. The chairman said, if you want to be a delegate to the Republican National Convention, please raise your hand. And I looked around, and hands were going up. But mine stayed down. And it stayed down because I was scared, I was nervous, and I was too weak to put myself out there. I came ready to do it. That's what I was there for. But I was too scared. And my hand stayed down until at the very last second, I felt a hand grab my elbow from behind me, and it shot my arm straight up into the air, just like this. And I was frozen in fear anyway, so I stayed frozen like this. And the chairman called on me, and I got up, and I gave my speech, and people voted. And I won. A tiny little risk to give a speech in front of 20 people, and I got rewarded. I won. And then I moved on, and I faced the next round of people, the, the Romney campaign, all, all their people to run for delegate. And I showed up there in front of 300 people this time. I raised my hand, I gave my speech, and I won. Little tiny risks that gave me big rewards. Except, so I was, I was elected as a delegate to the Republican National Convention at 18 years old. And I thought that was pretty cool. People thought, you know, I can pretend that that's impressive. But my opponents didn't think it was impressive. Or they didn't care. And they didn't like that I won because I wasn't supporting their guys. So what they did is they just simply stole that seat from me. They stole something that I won fair and square. And I said, no. You're not going to get away with this. I'm going to humiliate you. And I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that you stole from me. Because I'm not going to take this just because I'm a young kid. So I went to the media, I wanted to make sure everybody knew. I went to the Boston Globe, and they wrote a story. I went to the Boston Herald, and they wrote a story, but that wasn't enough for me, I wanted more. So we went national, and Politico picked up the story, and all these other national outlets picked up the story. And I said, that's great, but no one really reads anymore, right? So I want people to hear my story, so I went to the radio, and I did some little radio shows, and I said, this is fun, this is good, and I think it's effective, but I need more. I want TV, I want television. And I don't want like Fox 25 or Channel 7 or, or uh, ABC. I want national television. So I emailed MSNBC again and again and again until the producer of the Rachel Maddow show, their biggest show, their, most, their, their, their highest rated show, called me on my cell phone and said, Evan, we want to fly you out to New York. And uh, Rachel's read your email and she would love to have you on the show. In front of 1.1 million people for 10 minutes, on live national television. I was terrified, but I knew that I had to take that risk because I had nothing to lose. So I flew out there, I stepped in the studio, and for once in my life, I swear it's the first time it will be the only time, I did everything right. I nailed it, it was perfect, because I prepared. And then, because I had humiliated them on national television, the people who stole that seat from me, they gave it back. And I was elected, as I should have been, as a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 2012 um, at 18 years old. And since then, I was elected to the school committee at 19. I am the, uh, let me see if I can make up a resume in front of you. I'm the youngest school committeeman in the state. I'm the youngest elected Republican in the state. Um, and most recently, I accepted a job at 19 years old that pays me more than I could have ever expected to be paid if I waited three years, like everyone else, and got a degree in film video, and got a startup job in that industry. And you know what my boss was most impressed by? It wasn't my resume, all the accolades, all the titles that I just listed. It was my performance on the Rachel Maddow show. That's what stuck with him. Those 10 minutes changed my life forever. And if, remember, if I didn't want to be a delegate, I wouldn't have been on television. And if somebody didn't help me raise my hand that day when I was too weak to do it, I would have never 
than anybody running as a delegate. One risk led to another, and I never told you who that guy was who raised my hand for me. Many of you know him. Uh, he taught me to be an adult. He taught me to be a professional, and most importantly, he taught me to never back down from a fight. Please give a huge round of applause to one of your finest educators, Mr. Jonathan Barris. If there's one thing I want you to take away from my comments, and I know I'm going along, if there's one thing I want you to take away from my comments, it's that if there's ever a time to put yourself out there, it's right now. Because no one, frankly, expects anything of an 18 or 19 year old kid, or a 17 year old kid. So if you do anything at all, they're going to be impressed. And it'll start you on a path that most of your peers will not embark on. If you have the confidence and you're willing to do it, you should do it now. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm, I'm already crying because I'm so proud. Uh, that was awesome, Evan. Really, really. I mean, who does that? Are you even 20 yet? I just turned 20. Just turned 20. Who does that? I'm what, old. A, what if he's old? What a great story about taking risks. Um, and I'm just so proud of you, Evan. So proud. Um, that was awesome. Okay, so uh, let's move on to a graduate from much longer ago. Uh, from 1968, we have Mr. Robert Walsh here, and he is being recognized at this evening's induction ceremony for his contributions to the military. Mr. Walsh. It's a tough speech to follow. Uh, pretty motivational. Good job. Thank you. Um, I wasn't sure of the format, so... I did plan on talking about the, my military background, so I'll just do a synopsis and a little bit at the end, and we'll take it from there. And uh, it did. Started in 1968. In this coming June, it will be 46 years when I left Wakefield, took the train from uh, South Station, and went to Paris Island and became a Marine. And I was a private when I started out. And uh, I did that for four years, and uh, got out, came back. I joined the Massachusetts Army National Guard, and during that time there, I, uh, I was involved with the operation of rescuing folks in Revere and clearing out the snow in uh, the blizzard of 78. Did that for a while. I transferred over to the uh, Army Reserve. In the late 1990s, I went down to do an active duty stint uh, down in Bayonne, New Jersey, with the Military Traffic Management Command. From there, I went to Bosnia for a year. After Bosnia, I came back and I went to Central America. And I was uh, supporting Operation uh, New Orleans Horizontes, uh, New Horizons, down in El Salvador. Um, and I took a break, back on reserves again, the 9 11 came. Uh, my unit, the unit is out of Brockton, but we were called to go to Jacksonville, Florida, which is support operations. And we loaded up the 101st Airborne Air Assault Division to. Uh, go to Iraq, we'll go to Kuwait, we'll go not into Iraq and start the war. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things that go along with that, but you can ask me offline afterwards, I'll tell you that stuff too. But uh, then after that, I was doing what they call LNO, it's a liaison office, and I worked with the people down at Fort McPherson in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, with the uh, USOC, United States Army Reserve Command, and I worked with Forces Command as well. And this is basically putting together units and then providing people to fill those units and then sending those units off to do whatever missions they need to do. And I continued with my LNO uh, position and I moved up to the Navy Yard in DC and worked with the Military Sealer Command. And they run all the vessels. And they even, even though it's, the Navy has their vessels, they are overall of all the stuff that goes on. And then, uh, and it may sound like it's kind of neat. I went to Miami, but Miami, I worked with South Coast. So basically, I was in a building in Miami, just doing the same thing, working with the South Coast folks who have coverage or oversight of South America and Central America. In the midst of all that, <clears throat> I, uh, I did a tour in Iraq, and I, uh, I led a MIT. The MIT is a military transition team. And we went over to uh, northern Iraq and uh, 
live with the Iraqi soldiers and train them up in logistics and transportation. And that was the 4th MTR, 4th uh, Military Transportation Regiment, which was part of the 4th uh, uh, Iraqi Army Division. And uh, the game you can ask me about that, so that was interesting. Um, um, I'm going by I'm trying to figure out and not leave anything out, but there are other pieces that are left out. But then I wrapped up my career as an exercise chief. And it's not calisthenics, but it's more like we would put together things like events, like catastrophic events, but make believe that there was an exercise. But we would but if you came and we were having like a briefing now, we have actual newscasts on screen that look like the real thing, and we'd have actual players. But nothing's really going on. But the people in the audience were part of the play. And they would act accordingly. So and, and that was the last uh, formal assignment I had. And so I retired in uh, 2010 from the Army as a Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, the big point, though, is what did Wakefield have to do with this? And the thing is that when I left as an 18 year old, I, uh, I didn't know, or I didn't realize what had been provided to me, but through the whole system, from grammar school up to high school. But in education, teaching, coaching, mentoring, caring, and the, the friendships that I made, in some cases, they last today. <clears throat> and what that did, and, and again, unbeknownst to me at the time, was it gave me that base, that foundation, that allowed me to do that transition from being a, a teenager into a young adult, and then to move out and step off on my journey. And that journey continues today. So it, I'm just telling you my experiences, but it's really, you are the folks that are going to, in some cases, have already started your journey. But once you move on from high school, you're really going to be moving into it. And that's an exciting thing. It's going to be a great adventure. And uh, I wish you well. And thanks for having me. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Um, are any students um, entering the military right from high school? Several right here? Wonderful. So we have the great... So it would be great for you to make that connection after the assembly today. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Marion Whiting. She's a graduate of the class of 1950, and she's being recognized at tonight's induction ceremony for her contributions to government. Marion. I'm sure that 1950 must sound like the dark ages to you students of 2014. But in 1950, of course, that was the era of the neighborhood elementary schools. And after you were in the same school for eight years, it was exciting to go to the Wakefield High School, with joining all other students from all over Wakefield, and being able to move from one class to another. After, after um, graduating, and it went to college, and married, and my husband and I raised five children, who like their parents, enjoyed their time at Wakefield High School. And then, after, they were through, after my children were through school, I went to work for the Council on Aging and then went on to be the Director of Elderly Services for the Town of Wakefield. And it, at that time, the few services that we offered were done in the local churches in their facilities. But it became apparent that Wakefield, like surrounding communities, would need one location to offer the many services, activities, and social events that were available to residents 60 years and older. So I, at that time, applied for a senior center grant and was lucky to receive it. So with the um, approval of the selectmen and support from then town manager Tom Butler, we began the uh, long process of acquiring an old um, abandoned barn school and converting that into a state-of-the-art senior center. 
So while at, while at high school, I made many lifelong friends and developed relationships that were very valuable in my future work. And not only was it a joy to work with senior citizens, but it was very important to me to do that in my hometown. So hopefully you'll be able to find a career that will suit you like that did for me. And I wish you all a lot of luck in the future. I, I think many of you are involved in different community service projects at this time in your life, and uh, you're doing a lot to service your community, but who better to serve than, uh, than our seniors? And uh, what a wonderful uh, thing that you've done for our community. Thank you so much. So uh, next is someone who's very familiar to you. Um, uh, being inducted tonight is the head of our guidance department, Mr. H.A. Beebe. He, uh, did anyone see his adorable picture on a digital display? If you haven't seen it, it's like the cutest thing in the world. Um, his picture from high school. So the main office is a TV screen out in the front. Um, so he graduated in 1978 from Wakefield Memorial High School and has been here ever since. Um, never left. Uh, but I, I, you know, when we first were talking about his induction to the Hall of Fame, what I really reflected on and I thought about that there's probably no single person um, anywhere at any time who's had more of an impact on more student lives over a greater period of time than A.J. Beatty. He's also one of the people that I respect and admire most in my life, and uh, he's a man of great intelligence and wisdom, and uh, we benefit every day, every student has had an opportunity to, uh, to have an encounter with Mr. Beatty. So congratulations to Mr. Beatty. And, uh, but for a few years, like you, I'm off to college and been here ever since. So uh, I'm very familiar with this building and, and everything that you're going through. But those are kind of interesting connections from what I heard. One thing about what Mrs. Marion said, uh, uh, Mrs. Whiting said, um, even when we had those neighborhood schools, because I'm old enough to remember those as well, we actually got to go home for lunch during those days to go to school. They'd let you walk home for lunch. And, and hope that you would come back, and we actually went back. <laughs> but it was a strange phenomenon in those days to be able to go home for lunch. So here we go with my remarks. Wish me luck. For those of you that know me, you understand that this is difficult for me on many levels. First of all, here we go, I'm likely to struggle with my emotions. But like uh, everyone else, we like a good train wreck. And, uh, NASCAR has fans for a reason, so let's see where this goes. And uh, secondly, it's especially difficult for me to accept acknowledgement for something that I didn't do on my own, or couldn't have done, without uh, the support of uh, other friends, family, educators, and students. So on that, that note, let me try and tell you a little bit of my story. First of all, um, many Hall of Fame struggle with the issues of admitting PED users. And for those of you that are not familiar with that term, those are performing enhancing drugs. The, the Wakefield Memorial High School Hall of Fame doesn't have a problem with that because here I stand. But my PED stands for Performance Enhanced Dreamer. And that's where I need to begin because that might explain to you more of how I ended up here. 
I know uh, many of you might be thinking, Mr. Beebe in the Hall of Fame, I've been here for four years and never seen him do anything. <laughs> How does this happen? While I might tend to agree with you on that logic, I would like to more acquit it and my merits with uh, this candidacy to a sporting event that you may have attended, where you'd walk out of the game likely saying, boy, what a great game. But I don't think you'd ever hear yourself saying, boy, those referees did a great job today. <laughs> so I guess I'd like to say I'm like that referee that does his job so well that the players and their performances shine through for everybody to see. I do stuff around here that makes things happen for you and for your teachers so that you can say that this is a great place to go to school. Pause. <laughs> So in that vein, I don't want to talk about myself, I don't want to talk to you, I want to talk about you. Is this okay? <laughs> By the time I retire from here, I will have come to school and experienced the joy and company of over 8,000 kids. I did this this morning, which was very easy. Uh, I have witnessed them two to their peers, nurse each other when they're sick, win championships, give beautiful performances, create outrageous works of art, rally around dying teachers, and have fundraisers for faculty members whose houses have burned down. I've watched you serve your country, get married, have children, and I've been there when they passed. And I've watched you come to school every day and enjoy every ounce of it. And I've watched you come to school when you hated it. And in both cases, I know you came here because this is your home. your compassion for less capable and less fortunate students, give your time as teaching assistants, join committees, and offer your advice to how to better your school and your community. <laughs> you gotta stop that camera. <laughs> Come on. In 28 years, I've never once invited one of you into my office, and I'm talking those 8,000 kids, to ask you for help, or ask me, ask you to help me, and never had one of you refuse me to do something, even if it was shoveling somebody else's driveway when you don't even shovel your own. So you are the 8,000 kids that through your action have given me the green light to be me in this building. Not only to dream of a better school each day and every day, every day, but actually to create one with the help of my very talented colleagues and you with your eagerness to dream and implement with us. With us. So the answer to the question is, what, what do I do? I get to school, come to school every day and dream. What I do do also is surround myself with people who will tell me the truth, not what I want to hear. I make mistakes, I own them, I apologize for them when I work harder. I'm also fueled by a dueling and furious insecurity confidence complex. Try that one in psychology. I know what I'm doing, but I'm never secure that it's good enough. And I know we can always do better. I am honest to admit that I'm married up and that I have two blessed children that gracefully accept that they had to share their dad with 8,000 other brothers and sisters. Hang on. <laughs> uh, I work with them, and I work with people, and I work for you. And it makes this the greatest school experience a teacher and a student could ask for. 
So in the final analysis, the answer to the question is, what do I do? The simple answer is that I love you. I love you for being warriors that I dreamed of and dared you to be. Compassionate, intelligent, driven, supportive, I say talented, and trusted. Hang on. Almost there. <laughs> and yes, I expect that many of you someday will have to stand here and do the same thing I'm doing now. So dream big. Be passionate. And you will always be as humbled and honored as I am to have this opportunity to address you and share this stage with my talented company. Let me leave you with some words of wisdom from Mother Teresa that are installed outside this very theater. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow, but do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, it may never be enough, but give the world the best you have anyway. So in closing, as my good friend in the main office would say, it is indeed a great day to be a warrior. So moving on, um, we're moving on to the sciences. Uh, we have a graduate from 1980, Marianne Shea. Welcome. Winston Churchill, who was a great Prime Minister of Britain, once said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. My story really isn't that remarkable. If you look through the pages of history, you'll find lots of names that we normally don't associate with failure. They say that it took Thomas Edison a thousand attempts before he hit on the right design for the light bulb. And it's fortunate for us that he persevered. But I bet that he learned a lot from those previous 999 failed attempts. 
We underestimate the power of failure to be transformative. We learn a lot from it. So never fail, fear failure. In the course of my reading, I came across a Japanese proverb, and it says, Nana Kurubi Yaoki. What that means is fall down seven times, stand up eight. So my wish for the graduating class of 2014 <coughs> is not that you never fall down, but that you always, always stand back up again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we are honored to have with us today, from the class of 1982, Brad Mastrangelo, who is being recognized for his contribution to the arts. Thank you very much. Um, I am a stand-up comedian. So uh, being here, I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't a straight-A student. I uh, strive for D's. <laughs> a C was, we went to dinner. <laughs> but uh, I guess my point like this anyway in my work, so. Um, I could have written that if I wanted to. Um, so that, I need to say, I was... had salad. Theater. 
Um, and uh, I think all of you, in one way or another, has been touched by the, uh, the savings bank in Wakefield in terms of just such a huge presence in our community. Um, in a million ways, the savings bank has en enriched our educational program programming here at the high school. Um, and certainly to our memories, when you think about the, uh, how many of you attend, have attended the Grand March in the, uh, in the past before proms, uh, that's sponsored by the, the savings bank. Um, and, and again, to, the, to our venue itself, but I almost feel like there's probably nothing more important that the Savings Bank has done for our students in Wakefield than modeling what it means to give service to your community. Um, it's, the, their whole mission is deeply indebted in that. So um, we're so pleased to induct the Savings Bank, and, uh, and we're also honored to have with us the president of the Savings Bank uh, to speak to you for a few minutes today, Mr. Brian McCulver. Full disclosure, I'm a Stone of Spartan in 1967. <laughs> um, but to offset that, uh, I had three kids graduate from Wakefield High School 2003, 2005, 2010. So uh, I'm personally proud to be an adopted warrior. Uh, the other thing I would say, the only personal comment I'll make uh, as you look to college and you know, where you might be going um, after you graduate from here, I was an English and Spanish major. And for years, my dad always said, that's great, you can't speak either one. <laughs> um, bear with me. But as far as, uh, you know, the savings bank's been in town here since uh, 1869. So I'd like to think that for almost 145 years, we've been supporting education in some way. I have no way to tell that for sure. I mean, we do still have people with us since... 1969, but all the people from 1869 don't come in anymore, <laughs> so I really don't know. But I will say that the bank's journey here really started um, in 1979 when my boss, Don Grant, and then the superintendent of schools, Dr. Stephen Mayo, had this idea for the high school branch, which is down, as you know, across from the office. So that branch opened up in 1981. Over that period of time, we've probably worked directly with um, easily 150, 175 students, um, five students at a time. And it's been a great experience for us. I'd like to think it's been a great experience for them as well. That led to, uh, in 1993, and I would hope that some of you have participated in this when we formed the club, Children Learning to Understand Banking. It was basically in the elementary schools, moved into the Galvin. Um, and we've done well with that program, and again, we've had the support, as we've had here at the high school, faculty and administrators, uh, of, uh, you know, a lot of principals over those years. And in sum, these two programs have given the bank about two and a half million dollars of deposits to work with, that have allowed us to donate, again, over the past 33 years, probably directly $60,000 back in some fashion locally. Some of it has come back here to the high school. Some of it we uh, established a uh, scholarship foundation for kids coming out of the high school, obviously, at the Scholarship Foundation of Wakefield. And lastly, um, when Mr. Grant died in 2001, that was the 20th anniversary of the high school branch. And at that time, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, establish a foundation in Dawson uh, with an endowment from the bank of $250,000. That has allowed us to do a number of things, all for financial literacy. And over that period of time, um, since 2001, again, $10,000 directly back um, into things at this school, a couple of the elementary schools, but probably the biggest thing we've done, and I think this senior class may have been the first class to go, was the Enterprise City program in New Hampshire. Yeah. Well, you guys, the first guys, 2007, I think, right? Some of you, because at that time it was just one plot, I think, in the sixth grade. It's now the entire sixth grade. So that's been that's been positive. And I guess what I would say to you, as a as a business person, is this: whether you're in a company by yourself or a company with 130 employees, as I am, just participate. When you think of the businesses of Wakefield, for those of you that raise money for, you know, the athletic books, the play bills for the theater. You know, trips that you need to make as a class or trips that you need to make individually. There are a ton of businesses in Wakefield that have supported you for a long time. We're very happy to be part of that business community. But my message to you is this. As individuals, when you decide, to, when you go to work, no matter what it is, you could work from home. Um, 
give back to the school. It's really important. When you look at you know how well you guys have all done, uh, you know we're we're proud to be able to do that. I'm proud to represent a company that has believed in that for a long time, um, and I'm really proud to be with my co-inductees here today. Thank you very much. So our final inductee is another person who is very well known to you. Uh, at the end of this school year, Ms. Nancy Frederick will be retiring after 41 years at Wakefield High School, teaching at Wakefield High School. That's a pretty extraordinary amount of time. And I have to say, when I uh, first came as a very young teacher, uh, she was a person that I really looked up to and, uh, and was one of the people that really inspired me to want to stay in one school and give the entirety of my career to a school as well. She was a person that really inspired me to do that. But uh, I would say the thing that uh, I think about most when I think about Ms. Frederick is that when I go into her classroom and see her teach, uh, the students are riveted to her uh, and with her passion for social studies. And she sets high expectations for every child in her classroom uh, over these 41 years. And I can't imagine that hasn't had a pretty profound effect on young people's lives over time. So uh, without further ado, Ms. Fr Nancy Frederick.
One of my students exploded. He was going to kill this little kid. He already had his right hand in a cast from a fight he had been in before. <laughs> so I'm there physically barring the door of the bus. Uh, and all I can see is the, the headlines in the Boston Globe uh, the next day. Miss Frederick directs race riot. <laughs> Shy out 